All right, everyone. So I have the time is 12 o'clock. And so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, I just want to welcome everyone to Medical Grand Rounds at the University of Colorado. Uh, I am very pleased today to announce uh, we have an excellent and um, uh, an excellent speaker and a personal hero of mine, Dr. Gabo, uh, who I'll introduce in just a second. I don't have any major uh, updates or announcements for everyone today. A reminder that uh, Medical Grand Rounds will remain virtual through at least January 1st, and then we'll see what we can do about getting back in person, depending on how the winter season goes and variants, et cetera. Um, for MOC and uh, CME credit, you can use the link that's in the chat feature. If you have questions for Dr. Gabo as the talk goes on, please put them in the Q&A feature. The chief medical residents and myself will be monitoring those, and we'll save them for a discussion at the end of the talk. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce Dr. Patty Gabo. Dr. Gabo uh, trained as an intern and a resident at the University of Pennsylvania. She did her nephrology fellowship uh, combined there and at UCSF and came to Colorado as, an, uh, as a faculty member uh, in the 1970s. She spent her medical career at Denver Health and Hospital beginning as a nephrologist uh, and is currently a professor emeritus at the, of medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and a master in the American College of Physicians. And she describes her own career as having had four distinct components. Uh, the two of those center around her clinical work as a nephrologist and then the related highly successful work as an academic researcher, which was initially focused on body fluids, electrolyte balance, and subsequently on autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. The third phase of her career, uh, which many of us know her for, uh, was as a physician leader. She was the chair uh, and the director of medical services at Denver Health and Hospital for a long time before becoming the chief medical officer at the same institution before becoming the chief executive. Uh, when she took over Denver Health and Hospital, it was a uh, large, struggling public hospital system, and she turned it into the model of integrated quality care that we know today. During her 20 years of leadership in those various positions, um, she saw a hospital that ran in the black, despite providing $4.7 billion in uninsured care to the people of Denver County. Um, her final component of her career has really been focused uh, as a national leader in healthcare and sharing the lessons that she learned from each of those first three experiences with people across the country and really people around the world. She's authored over 170 articles uh, and book chapters, as well as two books, including uh, her most recent uh, book, Times Now for Women Healthcare Leaders, A Guide to the Journey. She was a founding member of the Federal Medicare and CHIP Payment and Access Commission. She currently serves on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Board of Trustees. She's the chair of the Lown Institute Board. She's received no, numerous honors, uh, which are too many to mention, uh, a couple most uh, prominent, the National Academy of Medicine Line Art Award, the American Medical Association Nathaniel Davis Award as a career public servant, and the AAMC David E. Rogers Award uh, and National Quality uh, Healthcare uh, Quality Leader. She's a member of the Manufacturing Excellence Hall of Fame and the National Academy of Social Insurance. And again, someone whom I looked up to for a very long time. So I'm proud to introduce Dr. Gabo. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, it's always hard to actually live up to the uh, introductions. Before I begin, let me explain my voice. I have spastic dysphonia uh, and the treatment for it is Botox does nothing for my wrinkles, but hopefully I have beautiful vocal cords. So what we're gonna talk about today is what actually determines health in America. Uh, since I'm no longer practicing, I don't have a actual case. What I have is a person that I know well who exemplifies the issues I'm gonna discuss. A.G. is a 45-year-old immigrant from Ethiopia. He has limited English language proficiency. He has been a cab driver for a number of years, and his wife works in a hotel. With COVID, his business evaporated. His wife was laid off. They could no longer afford their apartment rent. She and the children moved in with her brother, and he is sharing an apartment with a group of men. A food bank helps provide food. They do not have health insurance. And he cannot remember when he last saw a doctor or a dentist. This sets the stage for the two questions we're going to address today. The first is, what are the determinants of health? 
And how do we compare to other high income countries in addressing these? And this comparison is actually very important because it compares what we have achieved to what others have actually done, not some theoretic goal. After that, we'll turn to the second question, which what is the path forward to improving health and healthcare? The World Health Organization defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Cole later tied this to the healthcare system by saying, some people need health care some of the time, but all people need health and wellness all of the time. This wheel illustrates a number of the most important determinants of health, the healthcare system, income, education, environment, community, genetics, and behavior. The wheel suggests that each of them have an equal contribution to health, but as you'll see, that's not the case. In fact, the healthcare system, which we think of as equivalent to health, provides only 10 to 15% of our health and well being. And the others make up the majority of what it means to be healthy. The wheel also implies that each of these domains is separate, but in fact, there is substantial intersection uh, between them, and we'll see that as we move forward. What we've learned with COVID is all of these, except genetics, are really wrapped up in race and, in fact, racism. And we'll talk about the intersectionality with race with each of these as we go through the talk. Let's begin to examine the components of this will, starting with healthcare, since that's what most of us do. In order to examine our healthcare system, we have to look at four domains cost, coverage and access, quality, equity, and disparity. Now, all of you probably have seen this slide or one similar, which shows how US healthcare costs in red have grown much faster and to a much higher amount than the rest of the world. So why is that? Well, virtually everyone gets a piece of this increased healthcare costs. We spend $4,000 more per person on inpatient and outpatient care than the rest of the high income countries. And when the, you multiply that by over 300 million people, you get a very big stack of money at the end of the year. And the reason we spent more in this area is because of higher prices, greater utilization of some of the very high price services and the high salaries we pay compared to the rest of the country for everyone from frontline workers up through administrators and CEOs. We spend $500 more per person on prescription drugs because we don't negotiate prices like the rest of the world. And we don't look at efficacy of new drugs compared to existing drugs. And we spend almost five times on administration because of our uh, uncoordinated system. The only place where other countries spend some more is in long-term care. Now, what this slide doesn't show is what is consumed by waste in our system. And many studies have shown that 25 to 35% of healthcare in America is waste. 800 billion to $1.2 trillion a year that goes out the window without buying one jot of health for the American people. Now, I want you to remember that $1 trillion number because we're going to come back to it at the end. And this waste is distributed across failure, care delivery, care coordination, over-treatment and low-value care, fraud and abuse. But the big sources of waste 
are our failure to set prices and our administrative complexity. So what do we get as Americans for spending twice as much as other countries? Well, we get less coverage, poorer health, and shorter lives. Not a very good deal. Let's look at each of these. Every other developed country covers everyone who lives in their border, but not in the United States. Prior to the development of the ACA, we had almost 18% of our population without health insurance, about 46 million people. When the ACA kicked in completely with Medicaid expansion and marketplace, that number fell to a nadir of about 10% and 27 million. And then as states cut back on Medicaid and the marketplace was constricted, that number has risen now to 31 million people without health insurance. And in America, health insurance matters as shown by this study from the Kaiser Family Fund, which looked at the barriers to health care in non-elderly adults by whether they were uninsured, shown in green, on Medicaid, shown in dark blue, or with private insurance, shown in light blue. And if you were uninsured, you were more likely not to see a doctor, have no usual source of care, postpone seeking care due to cost, go without care, or not get a prescription. And what is also interesting and important on this slide is how well Medicaid compares with private insurance. And it underscores the importance of Medicaid in our delivery system. Okay, now here's a question that relates to outcome. One of the ways that outcome or quality is measured is life expectancy, because most of us want to live a long life, and it's an unambiguous endpoint. So given that we spend twice as much as other developed countries, where do you think our life expectancy ranks with one being the best in each age category? Where do we rank at age five, at age 25, at age 55? Well, you'd think since we spend so much, we'd be one, two or three across the board. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to think about what this line looks like. Well, here's what it actually looks like. We never get above 15th until age 75, and we become number one in life expectancy at age 95 when most of us are dead. And this starts right out of the chute, as you can see at the beginning of this graph. In fact, we have the highest infant mortality of any developed country, not an honor we should want. One way to look at this is by an ROI kind of method. What is our life expectancy against our per capita expenditure? And for most countries, if they spend more, they get a bump in life expectancy, but not so the United States. We spend the most and have one of the lowest life expectancies, which in fact is going down even before COVID. The other concern about our health system is the impact of race and geography on equity. This is also a study from the Kaiser Family Fund, looking at health status among groups of color compared to whites. And they looked at 27 measures and for the majority of the measures, Blacks, Hispanics, American Indians, and Alaska Natives scored worse than whites. The only group that did better were Asian Americans. Another way to look at this effect of race is to look at the mortality to treated conditions. And this slide also encompasses the geographic variability. This shows the difference between blacks and whites for every state. And there's a difference in every state, some much larger than others. But even if you look at Colorado, where I think most of us would say race is not a big issue, 
Blacks have twice the mortality for treatable conditions as do whites. Another way to look at the geography is what the Commonwealth Fund has done, which compares outcome of 49 variables and they compare every state to the best performing state. The darker the color, the worse the performance. And as you can see, the Southeast part of the country does the worst and they've done the worst on repeated measurements over the years. It's interesting to note that these are the states that by and large failed to expand Medicaid, which could have, as we've seen, improved the health of the population. Now you may be looking at this and saying, wow, look at Colorado, it's shining up there very brightly. We should be very proud and we should be, we're number six. But before you get carried away, let's go down one level more granularly and look at the geographic variability within the state by county. And this is data from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which looks at 35 variables. And again, the darker the color, the worse the performance. And as you can see, there's huge variability within the state. And this is true for every single state. Well, let's get it even a little more granular. And this is Denver. And life expectancy in Denver is 11 years difference between Globeville and Wash Park. A few miles makes an 11 year difference. And again, this is true for every city that has been looked at. This kind of data have led people to, to conclude that your zip code matters more than your genetic code. In fact, in America, where you live determines if you live. So this sort of data led the National Academy of Medicine to ask the question, which I hope all of you are now asking, which is why, despite a higher expenditure than almost any other country, have we achieved less health? And 400 pages later, they concluded that a major reason lies in the fact that the foci of our attention, our resources, and our incentives are too narrow. Our investments are primarily directed at the biomedical focus. What they mean is we're putting our money in the healthcare basket and not into these other baskets, which are more important. In fact, for every dollar, that the United States spends on healthcare, they spend 56 cents on social care. Where the rest of the developed world, for every dollar they spend on healthcare, spend $1.70 on social care. And that extra $1.14 per person matters. In addition, as you'll see, we have more social needs than other countries. So our social care spending is significantly less than our needs. In addition, we tend to put our resources at the end of life rather than early in life when there's a bigger return on investment. So let's go around the wheel and ask, how do we compare in these domains to other countries? We'll start with income, education, and community because they intersect. And I would posit that income is the single most important determinant of health. Let me say that again. Income is the single most important determinant of health. Yet, we are the richest country in the world, but we have the highest degree of poverty of any developed country. And as you'll see with this variable and many, there's an intersectionality with race. Native Americans, Blacks, and Hispanics have a significantly higher percentage of poverty than do whites or Asians. Now, we often talk about poverty, but most of us really have no idea what poverty means. So let me ask you, what's the federal poverty level in the United States? 
Just take a second, write down a number. The federal poverty level for an individual is $12,880. For a family of three, it's $21,960. So I ask you, could your family live on that? And the answer is no, and neither can they. And this low income status cascades to two other determinants of health, food insecurity, of which we have 42 million people who can't put food on the table, and housing insecurity, 41 million people who don't know where they're going to sleep tomorrow. And these two intersect. If you can't buy food, you're not paying rent. And there's actually a vicious feedback loop between housing insecurity and income. If you lose your housing, you almost always lose your job. And so you can create this vicious cycle that impact health. Not only do we have the highest incidence of poverty of all the developed countries, we have the highest income inequality of all the developed countries. And this is a calculated number and higher is worse and we have the highest number. And it's gotten worse over the last decade, not better. In fact, the UN Council on Human Rights concluded that income in America is a story of stark contrasts. We have 25% of the world's billionaires, but 4% of the population. 40 million Americans live in poverty, 18.5 live in extreme poverty, and 5.3 million Americans live in third world conditions. Now, it's they always say a picture's worth a thousand words. So it's important to know that 5 million Americans own a second home, often a palatial one, while many live in hovels. And every night in America, 550,000 people have no hope. Another rather dramatic example of what this means is there's a restaurant in Denver where a four course meal costs $110. The SNAP benefit until recently was $1.42 per person per meal. At the end of the day, a poor person couldn't get a cafe mocha. The Biden administration recently raised that to $1.82. So now you can get a cafe mocha, but don't ask for a muffin. Income relates directly to life expectancy as shown by this data from Chetty that mapped expected age of death for a 41 year old by household income. And there's a linear relationship for men and women with the income. The richer you are, the longer you live. In fact, life expectancy at age 40 for the wealthiest 1% is 10 to 15 years greater than the poorest 1%. And life expectancy at age 40 in the poorest 1% is that of men in Sudan, where they're actively killing people. So here's your next question. If you were very poor, would you be have a better life expectancy in New York City, San Francisco, Dallas, or Detroit? Knowing what my son paid for a postage stamp apartment in New York, I never would have guessed New York. But in point of fact, if you're very poor, you have a better life expectancy in New York or San Francisco than in Detroit. Now, the authors couldn't answer why, but a hypothesis is that New York and San Francisco spend a lot on social care. So they look more like other developed countries. And this is important because it shows even with poverty, if you have a robust social care system, you can overcome some of the impacts on health. Now, this also intersects with race and segregation. Cities with lower segregation, like Denver, has the kind of gap you saw, 10.6 years. Cities with high segregation and redlining in the past have a much bigger gap of 17 years in life expectancy. 
education links with income. And it matters from the very beginning of life all the way through higher ed. As far back as 2008, the Brookings Institute looked at the impact of early childhood education and concluded that whether the objective is reducing crime, increasing high school graduation rates, or providing children with an equal shot at the American dream, evidence shows that effective early investments can make a real difference by starting children off of the right foot. And since then, many studies have supported this. Yet, when you look at the percent of three and four-year-olds enrolled in school in the developed countries, we're at the bottom of this graph. We're below Mexico in the percent of children in early childhood education. Education intersects with race. This looks at a uh, bachelor's degree or higher among different racial groups. Latinx individuals have the lowest at 13.5% and Asian Americans the highest at almost 50%. And these intersect with ability to work and pay. Unemployment rate is shown in red and weekly earnings in green. Let's look at the comparison marked by the arrows. People with a bachelor's degree, people without a high school education. You're much more likely to be unemployed if you have less than a high school education and you're going to earn significantly less money. And like income, education relates to longevity. There's a 6.8 year increase in life expectancy for white men with a college degree versus without finishing a high school education. For black men, it's 10 years. For white women, it's 5.1 years. And for black women, it's six years. Another way to look at this is if you look at a 25 year old white male with less than a high school education, he has only a 61% chance of reaching retirement age. Whereas if he has 16 years or more of education, he has a 91% chance of reaching retirement age. So let's continue around the wheel and go to environment and behaviors. The United States has the highest environmental burden of disease, which is a calculated number than other countries. And recently, the World Health Organization has looked at environmental exposure, as has the Center for American Progress. And there's a strong intersection with race and poverty to environmental exposure. Communities of color have higher rates of air pollution than white, non Hispanic counterparts. Landfills, hazardous waste sites, and other industrial facilities are most often located in communities of color. Look at Globeville in Denver. Lead poisoning disproportionately affects children of color. Water contamination plagues low income areas and communities of color. Look at Flint, Michigan. And climate change disproportionately affects low income communities and communities of color. And the World Health Organization, looking at just air pollution, pointed out that this increases the risk of stroke, heart disease, lung cancer, chronic and acute respiratory disease, including asthma. All of you who are taking care of patients know that behaviors affect health. And the principal behaviors are tobacco, diet, physical activity, alcohol and drug use, sexual practices, and injurious behavior. By some estimates, 40% of U.S. deaths are related to tobacco use, unhealthy diet, physical activity, and problem drinking. And we've seen the opioid crisis and its impact on life expectancy. So how do we do on these compared to other countries? Well, we do reasonably well with tobacco compared to other countries. That's where the story ends. 
we consume more calories per day than any other country in the world and tend to have lower physical activity. And this has led to us having a higher incidence of obesity than other comparable countries, which in turn led to the higher incidence of diabetes and its cascading effect on health. We have the highest standardized death rate for 100,000 people due to mental health and substance abuse, 12 times that of Japan. We also really have the highest rate of violence. And this looks at deaths per 100,000 person year observation in young men. And as far back as 1955, we had more deaths from violence than other developed countries. And since then, it's only gotten worse. And much of this is due to firearms. We have the highest premature death rate and disability due to gun violence of any developed country, a hundred times that of Japan. We're way off the charts. And what's amazing is as bad as it's been, it's gotten worse as is shown on this slide, which looks at firearm mortality between 1999 and 2014 shown in yellow and 2015 to 2017 shown in blue. And the deaths from firearms have increased and we expected it perhaps in young people, but look what's happened in the elderly as well. This is a issue that we have chosen not to really address. So we've gone around this wheel and we've looked at how we compare to other developed countries. So let's come back home and look at Colorado. And let's ask the question, is the difference that we see across counties in Colorado due to healthcare or social care? And to have some insight, let's go back to the Robert Wood Johnson County Health Rankings. Douglas County ranks number one. Denver Health is about, Denver is in about the middle of the pack at 25. Yet Denver has almost twice as many PCPs per 100,000 people as does Douglas. It has almost 10 times the number of healthcare facilities, but it has a much higher occurrence of premature deaths. So on the face of it, it doesn't look like it's healthcare. Is it social determinants? Well, Denver has a greater minority population. It has a much lower high school graduation rate. It has more income inequality, which is a calculated number higher is worse. More children in poverty, more food insecurity, which is calculated a lower number is worse. More housing issues and more violent crime per 100,000 people than Douglas. So it looks like if Denver would like to be as healthy as Douglas, it does not need another freestanding ED. It does not need another urgent care facility. It does not need more hospital beds. It needs to invest in the social determinants of health. So let's talk about what we know so far. I think what I've told you is that America spends more on healthcare than other developed countries, but achieves less health. And that means we have to focus on the social determinants of health. We need to reshape our thinking about our quote, health system and health. Which brings us to the last question. What is the path forward to improving health and healthcare? Well, remember that $1 trillion of waste? We need to take it out of the healthcare system and not buy more hospitals pay administrators or doctors more. We need to reinvest it in the social determinants of health. Easier said than done, but we have to try. And that means there's something that each of us can do as health care professionals, as healthcare systems, and as government. What can we do as physicians? Well, we could be a trusted voice we could start to be a unified voice for change and educate our leaders about the importance of the social determinants and demand that they address the shortfalls. 
We should work with our professional societies and our health systems to reduce waste, overuse, and misuse, and redirect those savings to the social determinants of health. And our institutions need to commit to improve the long-term welfare of their community, not with a yearly uh, health fair, not with a clinic run by medical students, but by consciously applying economic power over the long term, use their enormous human and intellectual resources and leverage their role as a major employer. Healthcare is the, now the largest employer in the United States, and that has many levers. We could hire more minority employees. We could pay a living wage to every employee, including contract workers. We could reduce the income disparity within our institutions, which is enormous. The previous CEO of Kaiser, in 2017 made $17 million. Currently, an entry level clerk at Kaiser makes about 35,000. Is that difference really justified? We need to provide healthcare coverage and paid leave to everybody, including contract workers. We need robust tuition reimbursement programs. Many institutions will grant some tuition reimbursement for an MBA, but when I was at Denver Health, we also let it be used for English as a second language, for GEDs, for uh, certificate programs, so we could lift everyone up. And hospitals are now investing in housing options. Well, what can the government do? Well, the government has a lot of leverage, obviously. First of all, it could improve the healthcare system by providing universal coverage, by ending the fragmented delivery and payment system, which leads to the biggest category of waste, and fee-for-service medicine, which can lead to overuse and misuse, and create some kind of balance between profit and care across the entire health system. And then it needs to invest in the social care system. And there are easy things that work. And these are things which at least in the past had bipartisan support. Of course, now you probably can't get bipartisan support on the name of the country, but in the past, these had it. Earned income tax credit is a credit that people get who are working, but are very poor. And recently in the American Rescue Plan, this was extended to childless adults for the first time. And the amount of money went from $500 a year to $1,500. The child tax credit was also part of the American Rescue Plan. And this brought 46% of children out of poverty. 70,000 children in Colorado got lifted out of poverty with the child tax credit. We've talked about SNAP. We need to increase who's eligible and the dollar amount. The Healthy Hungry Free Kids is the school lunch, breakfast, and summer feeding program that needs to be expanded. The Nurse Home Visitation Program is a program where a nurse goes into the home of a high-risk mom at the beginning of pregnancy all through the child being two years of age. This helps the mother. There's more spacing of children, and the children do better all the way through their adult life. It costs about $7,200 a person, but the ROI is about $42,000. Tobacco cessation has an ROI. For every dollar you put in, you get 1.26 return on your investment. We've talked about preschool and communities are important as we've shown, and the Community Redevelopment Act helps communities reach a different level of development. These are the easy things, but there are hard things that are important fostering social solidarity, ending structural racism, reducing income inequality, improving education availability and quality, and addressing environmental pollution and climate change. These will not be easy, but if we don't start and if we don't think about them, we will never address them. 
I think it's clear that we know the road to a brighter future for all Americans. The only question is, do we have the will to walk the road to that better future? Thank you very much. I'd be glad to entertain any comments or questions. And you can always feel free to email me. I actually do answer all my emails. Dr. Kubo, thank you very much. Um, and if you are able to answer all your emails timely fashion, you are, you are once again uh, better than the rest of us. I, I really can't tell you how much I appreciated this talk. Um, this is something that all of our residents are just incredibly invested in and, and faculty as well. Um, there are a lot of questions. Most of them, many of them are versions of why. Um, so we'll get to some of the specifics. One of the questions that comes from uh, one of our leaders in health and health equity at, at National Jewish is, is a little bit of an explanation. Can you explain the terminology redlining um, and some of the other reasons why the wealth gap is so vast between black and white Americans? Uh, well, that redlining was a uh, actually a real estate uh, term in which certain areas were marked off with a red line and you couldn't get a home loan in those areas. And housing was either in some ways underpriced and in other ways overpriced for what you were getting. And that led to segregation so that communities of color tended to congregate in certain areas. And we've learned um, over time that when you have that and there's poor investment across a whole realm of things within that community from jobs to schools, et cetera, that health is impact. Um, and the second question was about why is the gap? Well, um, in, embedded in that question were, were actually two things. It's uh, They asked about wealth. And, and that's important to distinguish income and wealth. Um, when income uh, is different between Blacks and whites, largely because of the education gap and of structural racism that is both present in the ability to get an education and then the ability to get a job. Uh, and, and you all have seen the study where uh, if you look at two candidates and they have exactly the same CV, but one has a name that is clearly African-American in origin or suggests that, they're much less likely to get called for an interview. So, we, we have this structural racism. Well, I showed you the slide that if you don't have an education, you're gonna earn less income. And I showed you that African-Americans have less education and it's because of these reasons. They live in segregated communities the schools are poor. They don't have an option for a higher education as much, et cetera. Um, now the wealth gap is a more interesting question. Uh, well, obviously, if you make less money, you accumulate less wealth, but the redlining relates to the wealth gap because most Americans' wealth is in their home. That's where their asset is. But if you can't buy a house, uh, then you can't accumulate wealth that gets passed on generationally. And one example of structural racism about that was startling. The GI Bill, after people came back from the war, uh, people could use it to buy homes. And it was a big boost to home ownership for the middle class in America. But Blacks were excluded. They couldn't get it. So a classic example of how we actually put in our policies issues that create difference in wealth uh, among our population. And then why it continues, because we don't want to tax the rich. Uh, when you have wealthy individuals who pay no tax, when you have corporations who are wealthy who pay no tax, you have a wealth gap. And I don't know if many of you saw the piece that Rural Chambers and a number of people wrote in the Denver Post on Sunday saying, we're wealthy, please tax us. And that you shouldn't expect us to solve 
national problems by philanthropy. We're philanthropists, but you can't create a cohesive approach to these issues by individuals giving money to this or that charity. Not that we're against that, but and that's a long answer, but this is a complicated story that's woven uh, uh, about uh, wealth and income. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, think, I suspect that many of the questions we're gonna ask you will have long answers, but we have time, so that's good. Um, if I can sum up some of the, the why questions that, that are obviously very emotional, you know, all of the other countries that are beating us in all of the measures consistently um, also have uh, wealthy people and wealthy people at the top and corporations, et cetera. Why are we so much worse so consistently? Well, I obviously don't know the answer to that, but I, I can hypothesize. <laughs> So one of the things I've often thought, which of course can't be proven, uh, or at least not proven by me, is that um, most of the European countries having endured World War I and more particularly World War II, understood that if they weren't in this together, they weren't gonna make it. And that I believe World War II and how it impacted the daily lives of every person in a million ways created social solidarity. And when you have social solidarity, you tend to feel that, yes, you should have higher taxes. Look at the tax rates in those countries. It's high that you should have good social support. You should have health care. Um, you know, right after the war, Britain was in a mess, but they created the national health insurance. Uh, I mean, um, they, they had a sense that we all need to help each other. Now, it's pretty interesting that as that generation of World War II has, is dying out, you see erosion of social solidarity. In, in Europe with the populist movements that are going on. So we never had that in this country. In fact, the only war we had on this land divided us, our civil war, which we've never healed from. We've never really dealt with what that meant. Um, and as a result, we've lacked social solidarity. The, the other, um, issues that deserve attention is most of those uh, have parliamentary systems. And people have said that parliamentary systems require cooperation because it usually you have to form a mixed government in, in many of those. Uh, our system is not parliamentary. And so uh, we, we don't have that. And we're bigger than uh, these other countries. And, you know, it's, it is a question, can a country as big and diverse as this country uh, address these issues when we have the kind of uh, elected democracy that, that we have? Um, I'm not suggesting we do away with democracy, but just in case someone wants to quote me as saying that, but it, you know, these are all complexities, but I, I do think that uh, we, we've sort of been a country of every man on his own horse. And where I think the rest of the countries have had much more social solidarity. And if I had to say, if I had to pick one thing, I would pick that. And from that emanates a lot of these social systems. Uh, a slightly more more granular question, um, but it also gets it at something you brought up at the beginning of your talk, is a lot of what you're talking about are, are very large problems, and, and they're national problems that may require national solutions. What personal changes can people listening to this talk do to get started on solutions that they can fit into their already busy clinical and, and daily lives now? What, what can individuals do? Well, you know, none of us could do everything, and... Uh, so uh, my first piece of advice is to pick something you're passionate about. Because 
you, you know, there's no sense going off on something you really don't care about just because you know it's important. Uh, there are a lot of important things. So pick something you really deeply, genuinely care about and then perseverate on that. Uh, you know, it's, I always said that for 40 years at Denver Health, I said the same things over and over and over again and, uh, and believed in the same things. And eventually someone who has power will hear it and adopt it as their own. And uh, the other thing that all of us can do is, first of all, we should all vote. I mean, any professional who doesn't vote, I think is committing a crime. Uh, you know, some countries make voting mandatory. Uh, we, we don't. Um, you should be aware of the issues. I think physicians have a lot of credibility. Um, and, and I learned this in testifying. As soon as you say you're a doctor, people actually listen more, I think. So everybody should know about these issues, understand them. They should talk to their city council. They should talk to their state reps. They should talk to their congressional people. Um, go to forums. I mean, I know you don't have a lot of time, but right now, a lot of this stuff is on Zoom. You can go to town meetings. You can ask questions. Um, and then in your professional societies, almost everybody belongs to some society. Start asking questions there. What are they working on? Um, the American College of Physicians, I think, does an exemplary job of working on important issues in this domain. Um, but a lot of societies are only working on their payment or protecting their terrain from other practitioners. And so hold your societies accountable, ask the questions in those societies, and then ask the questions in your institution because you're all part of the institution, you have a voice, and I gave you the list of what institutions could do. And the most important one is to address income in the institutions. And ask not just, you know, I've been interested in gender inequality and in income, but we have to worry about that for everybody. The housekeeper, the clerk, uh, are they getting a care shake? Uh, not just us. And we can ask those questions and care about those people too. Another question on the larger political climate. Um, what are the prospects for universal health care given where we stand politically today and how could we get there? Well, uh, um, you know, I, I don't I don't think we're gonna get there with a stroke of the pen, okay? Uh, uh, and um, I think that the, although I think that as we have this fragmented system, it does create administrative waste that's enormous, but we're probably stuck with that for a while. So I think you can do simple things, well, not so simple things as we're learning. You could expand, expand Medicare by lowering the age uh, in a incremental way that could over time lead to everybody. You know, so you go from 65 to 62, from 62. And so it's, it's small incremental steps and you lay it out over a five, 10 year period. Um, I, I think that's a, a, a smart approach, but hook to that approach, you have to start looking at reducing the waste in Medicare. They have to negotiate drug prices. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're the biggest buyer. I mean, every businessman knows if you're buying something and you're the biggest buyer, negotiate your prices. Um, we have to get rid of the middlemen, the PBMs, et cetera, et cetera. So we, at the same time, we're expanding Medicaid, Medicare. We have to um, figure out ways to get the money out of it to pay for this expansion. 
the thing I have fought for for years, which has got nowhere as a lo- among with many things I've fought for over the years, is to federalize Medicaid. It, it's really unacceptable that if you're poor in Texas, forget it, compared to if you're poor in Massachusetts and you can get Medicaid. Um, we at least, if we don't federalize Medicaid, we we have to uh, create a floor that was tried with the ACA. And as you know, the Supreme Court uh, didn't allow that to happen. But we have to try again to create a universal floor for Medicaid that is the same no matter where you live. Um, there is the possibility of buying into Medicaid as well. And the expansion of the marketplaces with subsidized care is with the ACA really brought in a lot of people. So I think if we try to expand and improve each of those components, we could over time end up with universal care. I mean, you know, if we federalize Medicaid, which I know won't happen in my lifetime, and we kept lowering the age of Medicare, we'd eventually get to one system. Patty, is that what you think is uh, sort of the, you know, this is a complex multi-dimensional uh, problem that we've brought up um, with lots of um, avenues uh, that you can approach to um, address different aspects of this, this health inequity. Uh, do you think, where do you think we'd have the biggest impact? Do you think it's, it's in Medicare and Medicaid, um, lowering the age of Medicare and, and federalizing Medicaid? Uh, or, or are there other components that uh, would have a bigger impact? Well, that's it. As all these questions, it's complex. If, if you're, if you want to say, how do we get to universal health care? Then I think it's those two that we we talked about. Look, progressively lowering the age of Medicare hand in hand with making it more economical and efficient, um, and creating a floor, if not federalizing Medicaid. That's the way to health insurance. But if you ask the larger question, what's the best way to improve health in America? I would say what I said in the talk, income, in my opinion, is the single biggest determinant of health. And so for that, I would look at the tax code. I would look at the earned income tax credit, which several years ago listed, lifted 17 million people out of poverty. Um, I think that I talked about the child tax credit. Um, you know, when children start out in poverty, they almost never get out. So if you can lift children out of poverty from the beginning, um, that that's really important. So um, if I had a magic wand, which nobody seems to want to give me. I, I've never figured that out. Uh, I, I would say, let's look at our income disparity, which has gotten significantly worse in the last decade. And let's try to conscientiously reverse that. I mean, there have been efforts, you know, like lowering the minimum, I mean, raising the minimum uh, wage, um, the expansion of the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit. These are all things we, we need to continue to work on and think about. And, uh, you know, then there's the more radical idea about a basic income for everybody, just giving everybody a check. And, you know, there are places that are experimenting with that. I, I don't see that happening in this country in my lifetime, but we could do these other things minimum wage or income tax credit, that's um, The universal income, one of the questions from the audience was what, what is the pro- projected health effects of a universal income? Do we, do we have any evidence from other countries on that? Uh, there probably is, I don't know it, but I, I've, I've shown you the relationship between income and life expectancy, but it's also been shown for other health, a variety of health conditions uh, that income 
matters. Uh, and, it, and it matters because of many things, as we talked about, it affects housing, it affects food, it affects where you can live, the community where you live, expects what it affects whether you can exercise, whether you're being exposed to environmental toxins. So it, you know, it's a mesh. Well, there are many more questions and maybe I will try to find a way to ask them to you offline if that's okay, because it is one o'clock and I wanna be respectful of your time. Um, but thank you just incredibly so much for coming here today for these grand rounds, for this excellent perspective um, from someone who's truly lived this nationally and fought this fight for, uh, for over 30 years. Dr. Gabo, thank you very much. Thank you for asking me and letting me share my thoughts. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.